Hello everyone, my name is John, I'm the Geeky Fanboy, and welcome back to me talking about literature. Today we're talking classics, today we're going back to my study days, because today we are talking about the one and only The Bard. Of course, I'm, oh god, I'm talking about William Shakespeare. Okay, I can't, I can't, I can't hold this for the entire video, so it's gonna... Go here. So yes, today we are talking about one of my favorite authors of all time. And yes, does that sound pretentious? Of course it does. I studied English literature. Yes, I'm that kind of person. Just realize you can't even see this. I, I put on, I put on the, a Shakespeare t-shirt, yes. Uh, I, like my Ace Pride shirt actually has a Shakespeare quote on it from Hamlet. It says, men delights not me, no, nor woman neither. So we got the Shakespeare rap and the Ace rap in this video. Perfect. So today, this is going to be a, a sort of spontaneous rant. And this is probably going to have like major like old guy boomer complaints about stuff because it, it's not like how it used to be kind of vibe. This is sort of the vibe we're working with today. Um, if that's not your thing, I completely understand. Um, but yeah, so today we're talking about Shakespeare. A bit of background. Why am I making this video? So obviously, as I mentioned, um, I have a master's degree in English. Shakespeare was one of my favorite topics during my study days. So I love Shakespeare. Hamlet is my favorite play of all time. Um, I've written multiple essays during my studies about Shakespeare and his plays. So um, I'm biased naturally and I'm a bit of a traditionalist as well so I completely understand if there are going to be points in this video where you will disagree with me where where you might think wow he's having like super traditionalist uh purist ideas about Shakespeare that I don't like totally get it I totally get it I'm also sort of trying to make this as objective as possible I guess um but yeah, so I'm a bit of a traditionalist, big fan of Shakespeare, um, fan of ye olden days and all that. So what prompted me to make this video, going by the title? So what prompted me to make this video is that I was shopping for books, as you do, uh, just a couple of days ago. And I saw that they had new editions of popular Shakespeare plays. And it was um, edition by... Uh, the Penguin Publishing House, and it was called the staged edition of uh, Shakespeare. So they had like Hamlet, Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, Macbeth, um, Much Ado About Nothing as well, I think. And I was thinking, yeah, sure, um, got to look at those. I, I really like the cover design. I'm going to put up some pictures here so you can see them. I like the cover design of some of these. I was like, um... Sure, I might think about getting a new copy of, of Hamlet, because that's my favourite play. And yes, I already have three or four copies of every Shakespeare play, but who cares? You know, favourite books and all that. And then I like f picked up a book and I flipped through it and it looked pretty nice. And it has like extra like easy uh, print and font. So it was so it's easier to read for like dyslexic people, which is good. Um, the thing that made me stop dead in my tracks you could say is that when i looked at the back of the book it talked about that these editions of shakespeare's plays are there to explore the origins of ya's greatest tropes but yeah that hit me as a bit of a surprise when it said in the back of the book, discover stage a limited collection of Shakespeare unabridged plays that celebrate the genius of the bard and the tropes that continue to delight YA readers to this very day. And I'm not kidding you here when I say I stood at the bookshop and was gobsmacked because I was like, they're not, they're, they're not, they're not doing this, are they? But yes, they indeed are. So. In the, back, in the back of some of these books, they attributed some very well-known and popular modern-day tropes that we mostly know from like the YA genre and from book talk. They assigned them to Shakespeare plays. So, for example, for As You Like It, the description was As You Like It, 
It's Shakespeare's brilliant gender swapping, fake dating, classic comedy of errors. Or uh, we also have uh, Much Ado About Nothing, which is described as Much Ado About Nothing is Shakespeare's witty comedy of words where sharp-tongued enemies become lovers and sweet romance turns sour. <laughs> and we also have A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is described as Shakespeare's magical romantic comedy of trickery, love triangles and mistaken identities. So I'm here to talk about this today, what, 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 what I saw in the bookshop and which I have cheekily titled uh, the TikTokification of Shakespeare. And again, to reiterate, yes, I'm going to be biased in this discussion. We, we've mentioned it. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of, in general, a bit negatively minded towards TikTok. I don't have TikTok, to be honest. And I know it's a bit unfair to, to judge the entirety of TikTok because I'm very wary of it. But I also think it's fair that I'm kind of suspicious of TikTok, I think. Right? I don't know. I think that's fair. Um... So I'm here to talk about this because I'm like, do we, do we really need to do this? Do we really need to do this? Do we, do we need to take these modern day tropes and TikTok tags and all that and apply them to Shakespeare? Are we really doing this? And if so, can, can we not, can we please not drag Shakespeare into this? So the first point I would like to talk about here is that, more generally speaking, I'm not the biggest fan of like these tropes because we don't need to and we can't like tropify everything. Like I, I, I hate this intense focus on tropes in general that's sort of going going around in like book talk or booktube, like the, the more general popular book bubble, you know, because it's always all about the tropes. It's about like, oh, this has like spicy enemies to lovers. This has a complicated love triangle. Oh, this one has enemies to lovers. This has, oh, there's only one bed, you know, you, you, you know, you know what I mean? If, if you've been anywhere on any kind of social media platform that talks about books, you probably know what I mean. And I'm not saying that tropes or like those tags or whatever aren't one, they're not 100% bad. Like I do kind of see the use in them. Like um, those tropes can help you to find stories or books um, you might enjoy. Because if you're thinking, oh, I like this one dynamic or I like this one plot element, I'm, I'm more likely to enjoy books that also include this kind of thing. And I, I, I totally get that to sort of, take this as as a useful tool to sort of gauge what kind of stories you could potentially be interested in that are within the same genre or that have the same vibe. But the thing is that tropes, they don't tell you everything about the story itself and very rarely they tell you anything about the story at all because this is a problem I have with, of course, generally speaking, this is a problem I have with how books, especially like very popular books, are often reviewed like on this platform or on Goodreads or whatever, where it's like, oh, what are the tropes? And then they just list a bunch of tropes in the beginning of their reviews. They're like, oh, it has this, 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 and this trope. And I'm like, that cool, but that doesn't tell me anything about the story, the characters, what the premise is, that it doesn't do any of that. And we're like, reducing and minimizing an entire story to like a very basic thing that can apply to a lot of different stories. I also think that tropes, especially if they get overused in that way, they often can give like false ideas of what a book is going to be like and that can lead to like um, misunderstandings and readers then will maybe have false expectations in their head of what the story is going to be about. And this can lead to disappointments um, because um, one person might think, oh, this trope is definitely in this book. And then another person would say, oh, no, that's definitely not that trope. Because these, these, these tropes aren't very clear cut. Everyone sort of understands them maybe a bit um, 
differently and I think it also comes down to the fact that not all tropes are always applied correctly or a lot of tropes are also misunderstood. My favorite example of this is enemies to lovers. I feel like a lot of people attribute enemies to lovers to romances in books that are definitely not enemies to lovers. Just because they have a bit of banter and are annoyed with each other doesn't mean they're enemies to lovers. And I see that a lot. And and then you like, take these tropes and apply them to stories like this and then it creates a completely false understanding. And I think this is especially true if you take 21st century modern day tropes and start applying them to plays that were written more than 400 years ago. Also, a large number of these tropes are mostly, not all of them, but are mostly romance or romanticy based. Yeah, you know, enemies to lovers, friends to lovers, there's only one bed, uh, grumpy and sunshine, you know, that kind of thing. Like most of these tropes are romance based and you can't just apply them without context to every different kind of text, especially not Shakespeare, because while Shakespeare does have uh, plays that include romance or heavily rely on romance. Not all of his plays are like that. Not all of his plays have romance as a major focus. Most of the time, like the romances we find in his plays are most of the time arguably within his comedies and there are comedies first and romance stories second. So again, you can't really ap apply this thing from now to Shakespeare. It doesn't work, especially because these tropes are based on our modern day 21st century understanding of classic romance stories. And we're applying them to history plays, tragedies and comedies from a man who lived more than 400 years ago. Also, and I, I touched on this before, I think tropes can like take away from the like actual complexity of a story like because we're really like just minimizing we're breaking down a really complex story to like these very bare bones very simple dynamic ideas or premise ideas and this doesn't work for a lot of books but also i think especially shakespeare who like who has these really old plays that are varying in their complexity and have so many different kinds of characters from all kinds of different uh, different like backgrounds um and, and 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 cultures and given the fact that they were written at a time that's so long ago they could they exist completely from removed from the historical or cultural or literary context that we have now so you can't really you can't really equate that. And I'm not saying that Shakespeare doesn't have tropes. Shakespeare very much has tropes and stereotypes and cliches and um, repeated storylines and plot beats that he likes to use. Um, but they're not the same as the tropes that we know now. And this leads me to my second point, which I already touched on now, is that you can't really apply modern day tropes to Shakespeare. It, it, it just doesn't work because first off, some of those tropes, like what, from what I got for, for like these particular books that I saw at the bookshop, like some of these tropes also just get applied wrongly. Like for example, um, Much Ado About Nothing is described as being an enemies to lovers romance and when I looked it up on Goodreads and looked at some recent reviews, there were several people who also described Much Ado About Nothing as Oh, hey, Beatrice and Benedict have like a super enemies to lovers kind of chemistry. And like, but they're not. They're not. They just bicker a lot. Their whole point, their whole deal is that they bicker and that, but that deep down, they love each other they have like a ridiculous almost childish crush on each other but they're like too stubborn in their ideals to admit it and then their friends have to nudge them into basically admitting that they like each other but they're never enemies they're like not going against each other they're not fighting each other they're just bicker this is literally if you want to apply a trope to it it's like i don't know if there is there a trope there's probably a trope for that but it's like two people who bicker 
but are secretly in love. So it, it, it's not enemies to lovers. Once again, you did not understand how enemies to lovers works. People who applied that to whatever the hell this is. Um, then As You Like It was, I think, described as um, fake dating. And please, someone feel free to correct me in the comments, but I'm like, who is fake dating in that story? As You Like It is about a bunch of people in the woods and a girl cross-dresses as a boy and then goes to talk to the man she has a crush on and basically gives him dating advice disguised as a boy. And there's some other people in the woods up to shenanigans. Who's who's fake dating in that? If 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 they're trying to imply that, oh hey, the man doesn't realize that his girlfriend in disguise and then the two boys are fake dating, no. I mean, obviously there are queer themes in, in many, many Shakespeare plays. And obviously also in As You Like It, but that's still not fake dating. That's not the right trope to apply here. If you want to apply a trope here, which is the Shakespearean trope, cross-dressing. Pretending to be the other gender, pretending to be a different person. That's a thing that's in almost all of Shakespeare's plays, or maybe not history plays, I don't know. But like that, for example, could be a trope that you could apply here. But in that case, no, that's not, no. What? Midsummer Night's Dream was described as being a love triangle. K kind of, not, not really. It, I mean, there are people who like take love potions and fall in love with the wrong people. It's basically like a love pentagon, a love quadruple. You could maybe argue that the love triangle is the fairy king and the fairy queen and Puck. I guess, but then again, it's not really a triangle because I don't think the fairy queen has a thing for Pug. Again, it's sort of vague. It, I, I don't think it applies. So I think this proves that we just can't, we can't simply take a modern day, a modern, the modern day understanding of tropes um, and apply it easily to Shakespeare because back then those tropes didn't exist. I mean, I mean that in the sense of maybe they did, like in the way that just like popular dynamics or story ideas have always existed. Like it's probably always been kind of popular to, to have two characters sort of like bicker a bit before they fall in love because that's exciting to watch. That's maybe always been a thing, but you have to understand that our understanding of these ideas, culturally speaking, and, and, start, uh, and, and from the point of view of liter literature studies, these work differently because Shakespeare didn't know about these tropes, at least not in the way that we know about them. So it doesn't really work that you apply this idea we have now to these stories 400 years ago because they're not the same. The context is a completely different one. And I think once again, it would just give wrong ideas or false ideas to people who would then maybe pick up those plays because they expect something completely different, which just didn't exist at the time the play was written. And again, yes, there are tropes in Shakespeare, or there are tropes that existed in Elizabethan theatre. For example, um, one of my essays I wrote during my study days was on melancholy and depression in Hamlet. And Hamlet, also at the time, was basically the ideal version of, you know, the melancholic genius hero. And that already existed at the time. Like, people would already know, oh, there's a young man entering the stage looking sad with a book in his hand. We, the, the audience would have immediately, or almost immediately clocked what kind of character Hamlet was going to be just from that image and just from hearing one or two sentences. They would immediately clock, oh, that's going to be like the tortured melancholic genius hero they would have clocked that and again like jobs like this exist in shakespeare but differently and yes shakespeare liked to reuse certain aspects in his stories and and reuse cliches and stereotypes i'm not saying they don't exist like we have a lot of cross-dressing mistaken identity um everyone dies going from poor to rich the, yeah, this those those story beats existed those story uh, ideas or plot ideas stereotypes existed. Shakespeare really liked using them, especially in his comedies. 
Um, so I'm not saying that Shakespeare is devoid of those things. It's, I'm just saying we need to apply a, a different kind of context. And if we just try to take these modern day tropes, it would just give a false picture of what these plays are actually about. And it implies a wrong historical context. Because Shakespeare's old. Shakespeare's old. Which brings me to my third point is can't we just let classics be classics? It's old. Can't we just let old things be old things? Like there's nothing wrong with Shakespeare being old and and, and, and hard to understand. Like we don't need to apply modern day understandings. We don't need to be like, oh hey, here are some YA youth teenage things, so you can so Shakespeare seems cooler and I'm like it doesn't really why like we don't we don't need like do we really need this like let, just let the stuff be old we all know this stuff is old Shakespeare is over 400 years old and that's fine that's history be like that sometimes and I this is more of a general Shakespeare argument that I hate is that people say that Shakespeare sucks because his plays are old and hard to understand. And I'm like, that's not a reason to hate the play itself. Because I, I, I totally get it. Of course Shakespeare's hard to understand. He wrote in a different version of the English language that we don't have anymore. Shakespeare wrote in early modern English. That was the English language literally at a different developmental state than it is now. So of course it is going to be hard to understand. I'm not arguing that. I'm not arguing that at all. I'm just saying, just because the language is old and harder to understand, doesn't mean the story sucks. Like, are we saying the Canterbury Tales suck? Like, because they're written in Middle English? Are we gonna argue that Beowulf sucks because it's written in Old English? Like, do you know how ridiculous this is? And I understand that it's frustrating to to read stuff like Shakespeare, to not understand everything. Heck, I've, I've studied this shit for years and I don't 100% understand everything when I read Shakespeare or watch a Shakespeare play. Like, that's not even entirely the point. I'm 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 just saying like give 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 the give those stories a chance. There's nothing and I'm, there's nothing wrong with being old. Like also because actually for his time, for his time, Shakespeare's writing was actually relatively modern. And for his time, Shakespeare and like the theater, the kind of theater he did wasn't like the highbrow super cultural kind of entertainment <clears throat> that we think of him now. Not at all. At the time, you know, at the Globe Theatre, watching plays there, that was sort of like middle class, low brow entertainment. It's like the equivalent of um, you you go to the cinema and what uh, and and watch a Hangover movie or something. I don't know, like something like that. That's sort of it's a bit harsh, but that's sort of a bit the equivalent. Like it's not like people at the time you're going there. What was like always the queen and always like high upper class. No, they had hundreds of people standing in the middle of the theater. And if the play lasted too long, they needed to the toilet, needed to go to the toilet. They just piss on the floor. Like that's the kind of entertainment we're talking about. I'm not saying that I want to force you to sit down and understand Shakespeare. I totally get it. If for you, that's maybe like too, too much work or too much effort, or I don't know, something you don't want it invest your time in. Fine. Totally get it. Totally get it. That's fair. But then I don't think it's fair to say, oh, hey, Shakespeare sucks because I didn't understand one word. And I'm like, yeah, okay. But that's 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 basically a language barrier. That's not the story being shit. That's not how that works. And and there are ways to make, to like, make Shakespeare more accessible when you read it or when you watch it. Like, um, for example, there are editions of Shakespeare that have a modern day translation printed next to the Shakespeare version. So you can like read Shakespeare and then you can try to understand it. But if you don't like quite get it, you can look at the modern day version and be like, oh, okay, it's written in a more comprehensive uh, modern day 
English that we understand. And I think that's a good idea. There are also many, many uh, annotated editions of um, of Shakespeare where you would just have annotations for phrases or words that get explained because maybe we don't use those words like that anymore. Maybe back then those words had different meanings. You know, explaining how the thou, thy, and you work, and ye, what well, the difference was there. Like, there are annotated versions for this. And I personally also think it helps to, um, especially since, you know, those are plays, they're essentially, they're made, made for theatre. Um, I also think it helps to have um, a visual aid, like if you can watch a play while reading along to it, I think that helps a lot. Um, reading aloud in general, I think, helps because, again, it's theatre. And Shakespeare is not just about understanding his language, but just like hearing his language. Like I don't get every single word Shakespeare ever wrote, but sometimes I just like listening to Shakespeare because I think it just sounds nice. I can't sometimes explain to you why I like it because I don't understand every single word, but I would just be like, it sounds nice. So reading out loud helps as well. So try, like if you if you've never really read Shakespeare or thought of my might be a thing, I try to get into it. like just because it's old doesn't mean it's bad. Like please don't try to like ignore or damage the influence um Shakespeare has had on literature and on the English language. Because it's sort of like the whole point is that the kind of English he wrote is the whole point why he's famous and why we're reading him. It's about history, it's about the context, it's about development of the English language. It's not always about the story, sometimes it's about the language. And and going from that, with you know Shakespeare being old and also something I mentioned earlier, we can't just apply modern day tropes to Shakespeare, is that historical context is important, friends. Historical context is really important. Like you have to keep in mind that these are plays from like the 1590s to the early 1600s. Shit was just very different back then, and I don't just mean the language. So you can't apply modern day understandings or like modern day tropes to the language, but also, and I've touched upon something like this in my video where I spoke about that nothing is allowed to be controversial anymore. Um, there are gonna be bits in Shakespeare that you might not agree with from a modern day understanding. Yes, of course, there are like, there are sexist elements in this, there are racist elements in Shakespeare plays, there are anti Semitic elements in Shakespeare plays. Of course, there are. The man wrote these in the 1590s and early 1600s. Obviously, my stuff is boring. It was written 400 years ago. I know Hamlet goes on a bit, but. We had less distractions. If, if I was writing it today, I'd probably knock it off in a short rap. Yes, my jokes aren't funny, but do you really think your hilarious memes will still raise a giggle in the 25th century? They're not even funny now, if you ask me. And what sort of arsing mongrel is setting these questions? Did you ever read such Bolingbrooks? Is my work sexist? Duh! I lived in an age where women were literally male property. Apply some context. Zooms, it maketh me weep. Of course there was shit like that in there. And no, I'm not saying um, that stuff was okay back then. Stuff like that was, was never okay. But you also have to accept that, that, was, that pim si simply back then people had a di different understanding of those kinds of things. Like, for example, women were not allowed to be on the stage. So, of course, there wasn't really any true kind of female influence on the worlds that were being written and played in the theatre. So, naturally, there are going to be some sexist elements in those plays. That just happens. And, of course, you can talk about them and should analyse them. But, again, it, it would be wrong to just say, uh, oh, those plays suck because they include this shit. And you're like, N I mean, of course they were wrong, but... Again, history, historical context is kind of important with these kinds of things. And this whole thing comes basically back, this comes back to the tropes because you can't just willy nilly um, apply 21st century conventions to this more than 400 year old um, literature. Especially because Shakespeare is so important because of the historical context. Like, 
Shakespeare is important because he is like the number one example for early modern English, for this developmental stage of English. Of course, there were other writers at the time, like Christopher Marlowe, who were also important. But for whatever reason, Shakespeare is the one that we've decided is, is the good one. He's, he's the one we read. Um, obviously, not everyone would agree on that. I don't agree with every play being super great in Shakespeare. Uh, but you can't deny the historical context and the historical importance of these plays. And of course you can analyze Shakespeare within a modern day context. You can apply modern day theories. I mean, I've done so, like I've said, I've, I've, I've written about melancholy and depression in, in Hamlet. I've written about um, the role of religion and the ghost in Hamlet. Like you can try and analyze Shakespeare with like a modern day lens like for example you go in it with like feminist theory gender theory sexuality theory of course you can go and do that and I think we, we very much should I just think that it's also important to acknowledge the historical context otherwise you're just gonna mis like misrepresent and misunderstand the meaning of these plays and lastly after all this negative stuff I've said obviously it's great that we want to get people more interested in Shakespeare again. Can we do it differently though? And not with like this TikTok tropification of it? Like we don't need to like hardcore modernize Shakespeare. He already was really funny and hilarious in dramatic in his own day. Like for God's sake, the man literally has a I fucked your mom joke in Tights Andronicus. Villain, what hast thou done? That which thou canst not undo. Thou hast undone our mother. Villain, I have done thy mother. And therein, hellish dog, thou hast undone her! We don't need, we, we don't, I don't really like the, this argument that, oh, can't we just like modernize uh, Shakespeare, because a, a couple of people on, on like on like reels and TikTok and something were like that. They were like, oh, what's with all this oh, purple prose language? Can't we just like be like, say just this one sentence, just say it like that and be the be easier. Can we please modernize Shakespeare? Death that hath sucked the honey of thy breath hath had no power yet upon thy beauty. Ends up becoming damn bitch. You dead, but you still thick. It's not the point. It's not why we read Shakespeare. It's not why we. It's about the language. It's about all the elaborate prose. Does this man write too much and talk too much? Obviously he does. It's theater. It was the man's job. He had to write shit. That that's just kind of it. And yes, again, I'm biased here because I'm a bit more of a traditionalist. I like my Shakespeare plays when they're put on to be a bit more traditional. I'm usually a bit suspicious when you do like when people do like a modern day adaptation or production. Um, but then again, there are modern day productions, adaptations of Shakespeare plays that I have enjoyed. I'm not saying it's completely impossible. I'm just saying we don't need to modernize Shakespeare like this. Like, because this has the vibe of, um, oh no, this thing is like super old and dusty and, and not cool for younger people. So we're gonna like make it preppy and contextualize it with like 21st century internet lingo to make it cool for the kids. When has that? ever worked seriously when has that ever worked for anything like this hasn't even worked for I, I recently watched a netflix movie um dangerous liaisons like a modern day french adaptation of that and it sucked it was about social media and that movie was utterly stupid and horrendous because this this, this doesn't work this doesn't work most of the time you, you, you're not gonna get young people into it like that. Like, sell people on stuff like Shakespeare with the actual story, the actual interesting complexities. Like, don't dumb it down. You don't have to dumb it down. Stuff like Shakespeare and other major classics have some really cool and interesting stuff in there that even modern day uh, viewers or readers could get interested in. Like, for example, all the kind of gender and sexuality nonsense you could uh, talk about with Shakespeare, I think would be 
really interesting to younger people nowadays. Again, there's a I fucked your mom joke in one of these plays. Like, Titans and Chronicles in general is basically like a horror B movie. And if that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't sound hilarious as hell, I don't know. Like, you don't have to dumb it down, just sell people on it. Sell people on the actual story. There's, there's actual good stuff there. And I think this also comes down a lot to, like, with our understanding of classics in general, but I also think especially Shakespeare, um, that a lot of us, me included, learned about Shakespeare, obviously, at school, in school at first. And it's very much dependent, like, it's a big thing. Like, it depends very majorly on how you were taught in school about Shakespeare. Because I remember when I first read Shakespeare, I was like 12 or 13 years old, and we read Romeo, Romeo and Juliet. And I hated it. Because it was like mostly dry studying, reading for ourselves, doing dry analysis. And of course, as a 12, 13 year old, you're like, oh, I don't understand anything. This sucks. Because of course you are like that. But then a couple of years later, when I was like 16, 17 years old, and I had another teacher for English literature, we dealt with Hamlet. And the way we dealt with Hamlet was we read the entire play out loud in class with our teacher letting us read the different roles and our teacher only occasionally chiming in to be like, okay, let's talk about the scene. What was everyone thinking? What do you think the story was about? Okay. And then he would explain shit to us. Like, we would say, we think this and this happened. This is what we don't understand. He would be like, okay, yeah, I get it. And then he would contextualize things for us. But we had the fun of, like, you know, performing the play and making it easier for us to understand because we were performing it. We were in it. We're in the story. We're reading it out loud, thus gaining a greater understanding of the story. And, like, that's just one way of dealing with this because I, I see this a lot as an argument for Shakespeare, for reviews for Shakespeare, or also reviews for other classics, that people are like, oh, I had to read this at school. Boo! Sucks! And you're like, that's... That's not Shakespeare's fault, though, is it? You just hate school. You just didn't like how you dealt with it in school. Same goes for poetry. I have so many people uh, tell me that they don't like poetry, just like all of poetry. And I was like, do you in general hate all poetry or did you just not like interpreting and analyzing poetry in school and most of the time that's the case because i also hated analyzing and interpreting poetry in school but once i got into poetry myself i started writing poetry and i read poetry for myself i really loved it i still hated analyzing it in school because it was dry and boring but reading poetry for myself was brilliant so there you go, like if you discover this shit for yourself if, or if you have someone who's actually like really into this, can explain stuff to you, can contextualize stuff for you, this whole thing gets an entirely different notion. And um, unfortunately for a lot of us, we will be introduced to Shakespeare at school at first. And for a lot of people that will not always be a fun experience, which is sad. So I think we have to find um, different ways to, to um, Maybe make this more accessible. Like, like I said, um, there are, there's the possibility of you know having modern, more modern day um, translation of it while you're also reading the old text. Reading it out loud helps. Definitely go and watch um, productions of it live if you can, because of course this is theatre. It's meant to be performed. I think you would also gain a, a greater understanding just by seeing people interact during. Um, the dialogue also naturally the comedies work so much better when you like hear them be enacted um, because people can like play with the words and play with the actions and it makes it a lot more fun and there are lots of different ways to do it and I'm actually as a last point here I'm not saying that TikTok is completely bad in regards to this because I did read that um, there is a campaign um, that TikTok is involved in, let's see if I can find it here, um, with the Royal Shakespeare Company. So they invented a thing, they came up with a thing called TikTok Tickets. So the Royal Shakespeare Company and TikTok joined forces to inspire the next generation of um, theatre audiences. And uh, essentially, 
they joined forces, like the Royal Shakespeare Company and TikTok joined forces so to make to make it possible for younger people, for teenagers and students to make it possible to get um, relatively cheap tickets so they can go and see a Shakespeare show by the Royal Shakespeare Company. And I think that's great. That's a, a good way to get young people invested in this because they, they will think like, oh, cool, a platform like TikTok is um, supporting this this theater group and they're making the tickets for these plays accessible. Brilliant. That is definitely a reason why younger people would go to the theater, I think. Um, and I, I, I like I like stuff like this. Like this is actually something good TikTok has done that I would be in support of showing us that it's not completely impossible to, you know, modernize Shakespeare um, in a good way. That's it for this video. Um, I know it was a bit of an unstructured rant. I hope you were able to follow me. Thank you so much for watching if you've made it this far. I would definitely love to hear your opinions on, on this topic. Again, I totally get it if uh, you might might have thought while watching, wow, I have like super old man boomer vibes. Totally get it. And you're welcome to disagree with me in the comments. I would love to hear your opinions on this. Please feel free um, to tell me about your thoughts and opinions on this uh, in the comments down, down below. I would love to hear from you and hear if, if this is something you've thought about yourself or if this maybe uh, is a topic um, that's maybe a bit new to you. So let's... Let's talk down in the comments below. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you're curious as to know what I'm reading, you can go follow my uh, Goodreads and or StoryGraph accounts. Link for those uh, those profiles are in the description down below. There you can always see what I'm reading and I'm making it... I'm trying to make it a habit to review every book I read. So you can follow me there if you're curious to follow my literary journey. Also have a letterbox in case you want to know what I'm watching. You can head over there. Um, but for now, thank you so much. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't done it already. And I'll see all of you very soon. Goodbye.